Hello, I'm David Kempster, Marketing Director at Groundshore. We're delighted to be a supporter of the National Conveyancing Week. This great initiative by Rob Hellstone is an important forum for legal professionals, data providers and other stakeholders across the conveyancing industry to come together and recognise some of the issues that the industry faces and also to help support each other as the role evolves now and into the future. There's been some really stimulating debate and insights so far this week and I just wanted to thank Rob David Opie and Orion Marketing, together with all the other contributors for helping to pull the week together so successfully. Shrinking the Iceberg. So why have I called the session Shrinking the Iceberg? Well, Rob identified that the growing complexity of data and processes that are used in conveyancing will become the tip of an ever-growing iceberg. Yes, there's been ever more increasing requirements of the job, but I wanted to discuss, clarify and hopefully simplify the perceived complexity around climate change information in environmental searches. The objective of the session is to explain the context of why considering how the climate will affect property transactions in the future is important for your client. Also, how you can ensure that your, you and the firm help meet the incoming Law Society guidance on climate advice that will become a significant compliance element for the rest of the year and beyond. And I also want to recognise that you aren't climate scientists in the same way that you haven't been contaminated land or flood experts for the last 20 years or so. That's our job and that's why you get our reports through your search provider. And finally, I also wanted to slay a few myths about this being another complicated thing to consider and that we're here to help you better explain climate risks through tools and support. Environmental searches past and present. But firstly, let's take a step back and look at where we've come from to date. For 20 years or so, environmental searches have been available and have now become a staple and an important part of search packs. This was initially driven by the warning card and guidance notes for contaminated land in the mid-2000s for firms to avoid the risk of client action for failing to advise of liabilities under Part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act. These liabilities on the homeowner for the cost of remediation were clear in law, and consequently the need for more detailed historic land use data to be applied in searches than what has been available through public sources. This has now become a firm fixture in the process for verifying environmental risk for both residential and commercial transactions. But let's move the clock forward and following catastrophic flooding in 2007 and the PIP review which boosted more flood defence spending, the Law Society issued a guidance note in 2013 to ensure that the rapidly evolving flood risk to properties was captured. This defined the variety of flood types that needed to be searched and included in the report over and above the limited free information that was available. The fact that there have been subsequent revisions to the guidance up to 2020 tells you how the role of climate change has played an important role in changing the dynamic here. The important point is that flood risk is now a critical part also of verifying environmental risk when it was very much considered an option beforehand. Things move on as science, data, and more importantly, the climate dictates. The scale of climate change impacts on property. So let's tackle the first elephant in the room, the reality of climate change. There is an undeniable scientific proof that it exists. It's real, it's changing weather patterns across the globe. All 10 of the hottest years on record have been in this century so far, and we've had more severe flooding incidents than ever before. Sea levels are rising from glacial melting, and this is affecting the fabric of the islands that we live on. So we accept it's real and it affects us. So let's understand what it means for conveyancing, property, and our clients. Well, climate risks fall into three camps, physical risk, transition risk, and liability risks. I'll come back to liability risks a bit later. So let's take physical risks to start with. These are environmental impacts that could affect the asset or investment, like flooding, subsidence, or coastal erosion. These impacts are directly related to existing environmental search due diligence that you currently undertake. According to our climate index analysis, nationwide by 2070, 98,000 homes will be at risk of coastal erosion, while 3 million homes will be at risk of flooding, and 3.6 million homes will be at risk from subsidence, which is up from 449,000 today, which is an enormous increase. Aviva is estimating that some one in three commercial properties are at risk of flooding, with the average cost of a flood claim to insurers at around £50,000. 
And let's not forget that for river and coastal flooding, there's no infinite pot of money from the Environment Agency. Many areas, especially for those smaller streams that erupt from locally heavy rain, or for rivers in lower populated areas, it isn't economic to invest in flood defence schemes. We are already seeing whole areas of estuaries and coasts being given up to the march of the sea. Communities like Fairborn in Wales have about 20 years to exist and will need to be relocated. So anyone buying here is doing so in the full knowledge that their likely cash investment will be a total loss by then. In essence, we're going to be looking at wetter days getting wetter and drier spells being longer. The further north and west you are, the more it will rain, accelerating surface water and rain flooding risks. The further south and east, the drier it will become, accelerating shrink swell subsidence among some of the most expensive real estate in the country. According to the British Geological Survey, the number of properties in Great Britain which are highly or extremely likely to suffer um, shrink swell subsidence was 3% in 1990. That's about three quarters of a million homes. And it's now predicted to grow to 6.5% of buildings by 2030. That's about 1.6 million homes. And all the while around our shores, sea levels are rising and could be up to a metre in extra depth by 2100, accelerating cliff erosion across some of our more vulnerable coasts in the east and the south. And we've seen a clear example of this just in the last couple of weeks in Hemsby, Norfolk, where properties have had to be demolished after high spring tides ate big chunks of land away knocking years off the life expectancy of the properties at a stroke. For one poor resident, who bought her property as a renovation project just three years ago, she has now had to face up to a total loss. We'll come back to Hemsby in a short while, as it serves as a salutary lesson for conveyances going forward. There are also transition risks, the impacts of policy or legislation that moves economic assets away from high carbon, energy intensive activities. These include changes to energy performance ratings, retrofitting to meet new standards and costs to mitigate risks to reduce cost impacts on insurance or for heating and cooling. Much has been made of the EPC as the answer here, but while it's hugely deficient in its methodology, it is being used as a vehicle for lenders to consider retrofitting costs needed to get properties from one rating to another. A key example is with the buy-to-let market and uh, this runs the risk of thousands of mortgage prisoners being trapped in already rapidly rising rates who can't afford to spend upwards of 15 to 20,000 pounds to get to a C rating so that they could then actually access more advantageous lower rates or indeed find a new provider. But the same is also true of flood mitigation costs as well. There may be concerns about being in a flood risk area but if the home buyer can invest in resilience and resistance measures like non-return valves, air brick covers, floodgates, or at the more extreme end, raising sockets and circuits, that they then, then may be able to be retained in the flood re-scheme, which runs until 2039, if they're in one of the more extreme flood risk areas, or if they're just outside of the flood re-area, could be able to access better insurance rates, or at the very least get insurance so that they can get a loan on the property. But these costs will need to be factored in going forward and will be a key consideration in the future of climate data for conveyances, lenders and your client. Implications and duties for conveyances. I wanted to turn next to what this means for conveyances and lawyers in the context of client advice in the property transaction. One of the fundamental duties that you perform is that of the duty of care. And I don't need to sit here and tell you about how to do that. It's second nature to how you conduct your relationships and how you go about the transaction. Client care letters have inevitably expanded in recent years to cover processes for AML, source of funds, know your customer and so on. But there are important considerations also to how you communicate about environmental risks, particularly in the context of prevailing guidance. The fact of the matter is that there's probably been a duty of care in existence since early 2021 to advise on climate risks. Clauses were in place for legal professionals to use from the Chancery Lane project, where climate analysis at that time wasn't available to be able to comment on. But Marnie's clause, as it's known, at least gave a consistent format to accommodate the acknowledgement that risks did exist, but that they couldn't be commented on. Then, in 2021 and 2022, litigation action emerged against directors of global carbon majors who were failing to uphold carbon reduction commitments and greenwashing their way out of it, as advised by council and some external law firms. 
This has exposed managing partners and compliance managers to the growing environmental social governance risks, or ESG, which is based on the ethical approach as to how they advise clients on the impact of their activities on the planet, but also how they identify climate change as having an impact on the advice on the client's assets and investments. In July 2022, UCL professor Sarah DeGay in her UCL research paper series on climate change and the rule of law asked the question, can any England and Wales qualified solicitors risk not advising their clients on climate related risks? For which she concluded, my answer is a definite and resounding no. This was supported by Stephen Troman's Casey, one of the UK's leading environmental law barristers, whose legal opinion that we launched in September 2022 stated, Solicitors and licensed conveyances owe a duty to clients to provide warning and advice as to risks which they are or should be aware of and which may be adversely affecting the property being purchased. This is part of the general duty to exercise reasonable care and skill in carrying out their retainer. Failure by the solicitor or conveyancer to follow these practices may result in damages for claims for professional negligence, increased insurance premiums and possible reputational damage. Incoming guidance and liability risks. Recognising these important interventions and also the growing litigation storm and ESG exposure risks, the Law Society will be imminently publishing overarching guidance for firms about ethical policies on climate change, but also on how they should advise clients about the risks that climate change could pose to their assets and investments. We're expecting this to be made public any day now and we'll set the bar in terms of clarifying the duty of care. And now that climate information is readily available, and that there will be a heightened duty to disclose and to warn, it's important that firms understand and communicate this as well as ensuring that they've undertaken the necessary education, training and implementation of standard processes to advise and signpost these risks to clients. And on this, I just wanted to go back to the third and perhaps the most important risk on climate, and that's liability risks. This is a customer or a company that could seek compensation for losses that they may have suffered as a result of the physical and transitional risk related to climate change. These could include subsequent actions for failing to alert a client to a risk that could have been identified from analysis during the property transaction, such as in the environmental search that includes climate analysis. Let me take you back to Hemsby in Norfolk and the woman who three years ago had bought that property as a renovation project. This is an interesting example that with new guidance coming in, how would conveyances respond now? I don't know if it was bought for cash, but a lender would certainly have had concerns about how close it was to the cliff. Our climate index analysis shows that there's a 50% chance that the property could fall into the sea within five years. You can see from the image here that the pace of the erosion into the village is quite extraordinary. But it underlines the importance of using the coastal erosion risk data to identify the modelled pace of, that of the erosion and make it very clear that the client could face a total financial loss within the period if they went ahead. The client may of course accept the risk and that you would gain evidence obviously of that acceptance, but at least you would have signposted it clearly using the forward climate analysis and also have evidence of that in your communications too. If you didn't, then the client could rightly seek compensation for the loss if they weren't alerted through the search when the data was readily available. Equally, you could carve out risk advice uh, on climate from the retainer. But is that a great look in terms of client care when you knew that the information was readily available? I suspect that your law associations may not agree with you in the future. Communicating climate risks to your client. Okay, so let's turn back to communicating to your clients. You already make reference to contaminated land and flood information as part of the communication to the client about what you search for and what you report on. But we need to think about the role that climate change analysis has with this now. In its simplest possible way, climate analysis in our environmental searches is simply the same data that you've been using for many years, but now projected forward um, in a way that's as straightforward as possible to appreciate. Our climate index analysis does this for flood, subsidence and coastal erosion for up to 30 years from now. The same risks that are in the report, but now modelled ahead. So from the client's perspective, it is reporting on the same physical risks, 
The report shows the current and past information, but also through our modelling, how those risks can change over time. But the rating isn't the final answer. And that's why we've supported the weighted rating of the balance of the risks with detailed guidance that's specific to each of those risks, plus climate care clauses, which are based on that rating and that help you signpost in exactly the same way as you've done with environmental searches for years. By using the climate index analysis, specific guidance in the report and inserting these into standard clauses to both your client and the lender where relevant, this will help provide a clear, evidenced process trail to meet future guidance on handling client advice on climate risks. It will also go a long way to help satisfy CULPS and PI insurers who will be taking a far closer look at this in the future on how it could affect the broader risk management across the firm. And I also fully expect lenders and by association panel managers to need to manage these risks through the report on title with conveyances and for handbook guidance to change that also reflects the Law Society's guidance too. Lenders are coming under their own increased pressure through their own regulator to triage forward risks, not just to assess their back books. So expect this to increase through the rest of the year as the industry works with the guidance and the wider compliance requirements on climate risk. We took the view that it needed to be part of the existing environmental search because of the degree of threat that we all face from climate change, that it's real, it's here, and it's going to be a major exposure risk in the future for lending and asset values and also be a source of potential PI risk in the future, something I'm sure that we would all want to avoid. The iceberg melteth. So, in conclusion, I hope that I've painted a picture that's enabled you to consider where climate risk analysis sits within your existing approach to reviewing environmental searches, and that there are tools and steps that you can take right now to explain this simply and clearly to your client. By doing this now, you can get ahead on incoming guidance and future compliance changes, but it also ensures that your client has a holistic view now and in the future on the potential impact of climate change on the property transaction. We're here to help. Get in touch with your preferred search provider or contact us to arrange training and support and to get using the climate index analysis and clauses to help better advise your client. Thanks for spending some time with me today and I hope that you found the session useful. I wish you every success in the coming months and that you make the most of the rest of National Convincing Week. Bye for now.